Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the um, invitation and for um, making it possible um, for me to give my talk remotely. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, if not, then please don't don't hesitate to interrupt um, and let me know if I should, should speak louder. Um, also, don't hesitate to interrupt um, if there are any questions throughout the talk. Um, yeah, so I'll be asking the question, how perturbative does quantum gravity need to be? Um, and my tentative answer will be, well, maybe not as non-perturbative as one might first think. Um, and so the, the starting point um, of that is the goal to write a quantum field theory of gravity. And if we do that along the sort of traditional lines, um, just taking the classical action for gravity, putting it into a path integral and trying to quantize that perturbatively, we run directly into the problem of perturbative non-renormalizability, um, which is actually a breakdown of the predictivity of the theory, because at each loop, we are generating higher order counter terms. Um, each one of them comes with a free parameter, namely the coupling in front of it. Um, and so any prediction that we would make at nth loop order um, we could circumvent um, by some of the, the counter terms that come in at n plus one or n plus second um, the loop order. And so from that, one might then conclude that if a quantum field theory of gravity exists, it's probably non-perturbative. Um, and here I'm um, excluding um, the asymptotically free um, stellar gravity that, that Roberto mentioned in his talk, um, because it's very likely plagued by ghosts. Um, and so then this is the apparent conclusion. We, we apparently need to do something non-perturbative um, and then asymptotic safety um, by many people is thought of as an example um, of this type of non-perturbative quantum field theory of gravity. Um, and I'd basically be asking the question, well, is it really true that asymptotic safety is a sort of full on non-perturbative theory um, or, or do we get away with keeping some aspects um, maybe of, um, of a perturbative approach? Um, so very quickly, a, a lightning review, what is asymptotic safety? Asymptotic safety is the statement that all couplings emanate from a fixed point in the UV, um, with at least one of them being non-zero, um, and with just a finite number of um, relevant, and so infrared repulsive directions in order to make the theory predictive. Um, and for the Newton coupling, we can get asymptotic safety um, quite easily. So the beta function for the dimensionless counterpart of the Newton coupling has this term that comes from the canonical dimension of the Newton coupling. Um, and then this term here from quantum fluctuations where, where the hash um, is um, a number that, that has some regulator dependence or scheme dependence, so it's not universal, um, but it's generically positive. And so this gives us an interacting fixed point um, at um, two over that number. And the critical exponent um, of that um, is um, always two, as you can convince yourself by just plugging that fixed point um, in here and taking this derivative. And now we can compare this critical exponent at the interacting fixed point, so um, back here, um, to the critical exponent at the Gaussian fixed point. That's just the canonical mass dimension, that's minus two. And so you see that in order to get asymptotic safety, you actually need um, this um, the Newton coupling to be relevant, um, which means that the scaling exponent needs to shift by at least two. Um, in the simple approximation, it's shifted um, by four, but it needs to shift by at least two in order to make the Newton coupling relevant um, and generate such an interacting fixed point. And so from that, you would probably again conclude that because there is such a large shift in scaling exponents, a quantum field theory of the metric is non-perturbative. And then you would say, well, perturbation theory therefore is applicable somewhere um, around the free fixed point, but very likely not applicable um, around this interacting fixed point here. Um, and so that's sort of the, the starting point for me to ask this question, how non-perturbative does asymptotic safety really need to be? So is this conclusion that we that we drew on this slide here that the critical exponents shift by so much and therefore this theory is really a, a completely non-perturbative theory, is that really the correct conclusion to draw? Um, and the setting in which I'll be asking that theory is um, a theory not just of um, quantum gravity, but of quantum gravity and matter. Um, the, the motivation to include matter is twofold. First of all, in our universe, there are matter degrees of freedom. And so if we want to develop a uh, quantum theory of gravity um, that, that is applicable to, um, to space-time in our universe, we need to account for the impact of matter um, in some way. And an asymptotic safety that happens by, by really including the matter fields on the same footing as, as gravity at the microscopic level. And the second part of the motivation is that 
um, any theory of quantum gravity ultimately needs to be tested and confronted with observations. Um, and most of the observations um, that we have access to, or virtually all of them, um, have something to do with the impact of gravity on matter. So that's the second motivation. Now, what do we know about um, um, asymptotically safe quantum gravity of matter? It's sort of summarized in, in, this, um, in this plot here, where um, we have good indications that the, a gravitational fixed point exists under the impact of the standard model matter fields. We also have evidence that the standard model interactions can be UV completed um, by gravity. And this is the, both of these aspects you sort of see in the plot. So um, G here is the Newton coupling again, and you see um, it assumes an interacting fixed point value under the impact of standard model matter. And then the other couplings here are some of the standard model couplings. The little g's are the gauge couplings. Um, the yt is the top Yukawa coupling, the yb is the bottom Yukawa coupling, lambda is the, the Higgs quartic coupling. And you can see that these standard model interactions are UV completed by gravity. So some of them um, become asymptotically safe in this plot here, um, and others just continue towards asymptotic freedom. Um, and lastly, we also have evidence that there is a prediction for a subset of the standard model couplings that emerges from such an interacting fixed point. Um, and that is because some of the standard model couplings, which are free parameters in the standard model, um, some of them become irrelevant directions of an asymptotically safe fixed point and are therefore predictable. Um, and that is ultimately what then gives rise to observational tests of the scenario. Um, and um, if you want to look up the um, references in which provide all of this evidence, I'd just like to highlight um, some of the more recent reviews of gravity matter theories. Now, what I will now do is to go in a little bit in a little bit more detail on the quantum gravity effects um, on the standard model couplings um, to um, give you a little bit of an idea of what this theory looks like and, and where the evidence that I was talking about on the previous slide comes from. And I'll start with the gauge sector. So um, here I'll be looking at the beta function for um, gauge couplings. In particular, my main focus will be on the abelian gauge coupling in the standard model, so the hypercharge coupling. Um, so the uh, gauge couplings in the standard model um, have a one-loop term uh, where the beta naught, the sign of that, depends on whether it's an abelian or a non-abelian gauge coupling. And then there is a gravity contribution that actually comes in at lower order in the gauge coupling. And um, so it's linear in G. Um, this FG is just a way to parameterize um, the gravitational effect. It, it is just a, a function of the gravitational couplings. You can think of this term as effectively changing the scaling dimensions um, of these interactions um, because it's linear in the um, um, in the in the coupling. Um, and it's also important to note that this term is actually independent of the gauge group, which is just um, a consequence of the fact that gravity um, doesn't see internal um, symmetries. And gravity only sees the space-time properties of, of fields. And so it gives the same contribution to all gauge couplings. And now this FG, this gravitational contribution, um, that is constant if you set the gravitational uh, couplings to constant fixed point values. Um, so that's constant above the Planck scale. And then below the Planck scale, the Newton coupling um, scales towards zero quadratically. That's just the statement that gravitational fluctuations decouple very quickly below the Planck scale, um, and therefore Fg goes to zero below the Planck scale, and this contribution vanishes um, from the beta function. Um, there is one somewhat um, more technical puzzle associated to this Fg that I would like to highlight um, briefly. Namely, Fg is not universal, and you can find schemes, for instance, dimensional regularization, um, where Fg actually vanishes. Um, and so um, within the perturbative literature on this, um, there's a long string of papers, that I'm just highlighting some of them here, um, which find a vanishing or non-vanishing FG depending on the, the scheme that they use. Um, and there is a, a subtlety um, to that question um, that um, I investigated last year with one of my postdocs, Gustavo de Brito, um, where um, we showed that there is a scheme in which we also get um, a vanishing FG if we treat the gravitational coupling as a fixed external parameter. 
but we do get a um, universal non-vanishing contribution if we treat um, the gravitational coupling as something that also needs to acquire a fixed point. Um, so this is actually a scheme um, that Roberto and collaborators set up. Um, it's um, within the FRG and it is based on a regulator that depends on this parameter A. And so if you calculate the FG, um, then it is a function of A. And in particular, we are interested in the small A limit um, where this contribution scales as A log A. And so it goes to zero as A goes to zero if you just treat the Newton coupling as a fixed external parameter. And this is what people have done in all of these perturbative calculations. But now we can also calculate the beta function for the Newton coupling um, and um, the corresponding fixed point value that is also a function of A. And in fact, it, it scales as one over A log A. And so in this scheme, if you just look at the fixed point value for the Newton coupling, that would lie at infinite values of the Newton coupling. But you can already see that A log A and one over A log A that cancels exactly. And so if you actually evaluate this gravitational contribution at the gravitational fixed point, and then you take the limit A going to zero, then you actually approach um, a universal limit um, that doesn't even depend on the particular shape function um, of the regulator. And so we did this in this particular um, scheme, but we are conjecturing um, that what is happening here in, in all of these perturbative studies is that people do not treat the system correctly in the sense that they look um, as at the Newton coupling as a fixed external parameter, instead of also accounting for the fact that that coupling also has a scale dependence and an asymptotic safety will have a fixed point um, that depends on that scheme as well. Um, so that just as a more technical aside to, to clarify that I believe this result that FG is actually non-zero above the Planck scale, that that is um, generically the correct result if you treat the subtleties in the system correctly. So what is then the physical consequence um, of that? Um, so for non-abelian gauge couplings, asymptotic freedom is preserved because for non-abelian gauge couplings, this term is then negative and the one loop term is also negative. So we have two anti-screening contributions. For the abelian gauge coupling, beta zero is positive. So that's due to um, the screening effect of, of charged matter fluctuations. And now there is a competition between these screening effect from matter and the anti-screening effect um, from gravity. And so um, at low enough values of the gauge coupling, the gravity term dominates and um, uh, induces asymptotic freedom in the UV. Um, if the gauge coupling at the Planck scale is already too large, then the gravitational effect is not large enough um, to induce asymptotic freedom. And um, you would, um, in this perturbative treatment, still see a, a Landau pole. And now there is a particular value um, where these two contributions balance out, and that's um, what gives you asymptotic safety. And at the asymptotically safe fixed point, the gauge coupling is an irrelevant direction, um, which you can see because it attracts um, trajectories from everywhere. And that also means that um, you can't depart from that fixed point until you reach the Planck scale where gravity switches off. And that means that asymptotic safety here generates a um, unique um, prediction for the value of the coupling at the Planck scale and that translates into a prediction in the infrared. And you can see that this predictive trajectory, that that acts as an upper bound for all of the values of the gauge coupling um, in, for which you can get um, a UV completion. Um, something very similar happens in the Yukawa sector. So um, if we now turn our attention to the top Yukawa coupling, um, we have a very similar type of picture <clears throat> a positive one loop term for matter fluctuations, and then a gravitational contribution that is again um, linear in the coupling um, with an Fy that is again a function of the gravitational couplings. And so it's again constant above the Planck scale. Um, however, something interesting happens because the sign of Fy actually depends on the values of the gravitational couplings. So depending on what the value of the um, Newton coupling, for instance, or the cosmological constant in particular is, you can switch the sign of Fy. So let's take a look at the um, consequences of both signs. First of all, if the sign is negative, then that means that gravity screens this interaction. The beta function then only has um, a fixed point at zero at which the coupling is irrelevant. And so you're getting basically a triviality problem in that sector. Or in other words, um, the only UV complete um, value is a vanishing value. That's the only fixed point that exists. And if you've set the top Yukawa coupling to, to zero um, at trans scales, 
it will remain zero, it will not um, be regenerated. And so this gives us the prediction that the top Yukawa coupling vanishes in the infrared. And by now there are actually um, measurements of the top Yukawa um, coupling from the LHC um, that um, confirm uh, with, I believe, a five sigma, sigma significance that the top quark Yukawa coupling is non-zero. So that means that if the sign of Fy is negative in asymptotic safety, then that would actually be um, a reason to, to rule this, this theory out um, based on its phenomenology. Now, if, however, the sign of Fy is positive, then we have a very similar picture to what goes on in the gauge sector. We then have asymptotic freedom for low enough values of the top Yukawa coupling. And we have um, one asymptotically safe um, trajectory that generates a prediction at the Planck scale um, and that um, serves as an upper bound. Um, and that upper bound um, in this particular calculation here actually translates into a value quite close to the measured one. Now, of course, the, the key question here is um, where did this, um, this particular value come from? And that is related to the question, what is the value of Fy um, or where do the gravitational fixed points um, actually lie? So let me show you um, what Fy looks like in this plane spent by the Newton coupling and the cosmological constant, uh, where here uh, I'm talking about their microscopic or their fixed point values. Um, and there is this region here um, where Fy is negative. That would predict a vanishing top mass or a vanishing top Yukawa coupling. And then there is this region here where Fy is positive. And now the gravitational fixed point values themselves actually depend on matter. Um, and if you include just one generation of standard model um, fermions, then you lie somewhere here in this regime um, where you don't get non-vanishing Yukawa couplings. The fixed point then moves as you add a second generation, but you're still in this a phenomenologically unfavorable regime, but for three generations, you've actually made it into the regime where Fy is positive. And this particular fixed point value actually, um, if I go back, um, translates into an upper bound that is um, of the order of 171 um, GeV. Um, and um, the, the current mass measurements um, from the LHC for the, the top Yukawa coupling are 172. So we're getting very close to the, the actual value um, with this prediction um, from this, this simple treatment. Um, you can um, extend the, in these considerations beyond the, the third um, generation. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more a little later. Um, let me now just briefly review what the, the status of the standard model um, as a whole is. So similar mechanisms that give a, a prediction for the abelian hypercharge or an upper bound for the abelian hypercharge and for the top Yukawa coupling. Similar things can happen for the bottom Yukawa coupling and for the Higgs quad coupling. Um, so these are, are couplings that are in principle predicted um, from asymptotic safety. And of course, whether or not these predictions match observations is then a question of controlling the systematic uncertainties in the calculations. Um, and currently, um, we, we don't know whether or not the predictions match observations or whether the, the setting is ruled out. What I will now focus on um, in this whole scenario is the question, if we have um, a UV completion of gravity and matter um, along these lines, how non-perturbative um, is it really? Um, and um, I will give an answer um, and that answer has a number of consequences for the, the status of the theory. So the conjecture that I'm putting forward is that asymptotic safety of gravity plus the standard model is near perturbative. By near perturbative, what I mean is that it's not completely perturbative, so it doesn't sit at, an, at a free fixed point where the scaling exponents would just be the canonical mass dimensions, but it also does not sit at a truly non-perturbative fixed point um, where we necessarily need to, to use um, non-perturbative techniques um, as we would, for instance, if we look at something like the low energy sector of QCD. And there are at least three hints um, that this conjecture could be true. The first is coming from the, the standard model um, without gravity that is perturbative at the Planck scale. Um, and the second part of the hint is that if you then add on gravity to this perturbative standard model, you actually generate upper bounds on the couplings. So you can't go into a, a very non-perturbative regime with these couplings and still get asymptotic safety. 
The second hint is looking more directly at universal quantities, um, so at critical exponents, which are um, close to canonical scaling. And the third hint has to do with non-trivial symmetry identities um, uh, that hold within this gauge tick setting. Um, and I'll talk about all three hints now in a bit more detail. So let me start with the first one. Um, if we just look at the standard model itself without gravity, um, and we take the um, low energy values of the couplings that have been measured and then just run the RG flow um, in perturbation theory, we end up with values of the uh, couplings at the, at the Planck scale that you can already see are all sort of of order one half or significantly lower, which means that the second, uh, the two loop correction, um, which is um, higher order in the coupling and also comes with a factor of one over 16 pi squared, that is generically very small. And you can also see that by explicitly looking at the beta function. So this is the beta function um, for the top Yukawa coupling that now includes a gravity contribution. Um, and um, you can see in this plot here, there's a um, one loop and a two loop. Um, um, the result, the, there's the one loop and the two loop result that are overlaid. And um, these lines really fall right on top of each other. They differ only at really large values of the top Yukawa coupling where you're then getting also a sort of spurious zero in the two-loop approximation. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so that, that's the first hint. The standard model is perturbative at the Planck scale. And so therefore, it would also be somewhat um, unexpected if under the impact of gravity, it would be first driven into a very non-perturbative regime and only then you be completed. So this picture that the standard model is perturbative at the Planck scale, and then a near perturbative gravity contribution comes in and UV completes it, that, that um, somehow seems simpler. Um, and that is also supported by the fact that the gravitational contribution generates these upper bounds on the couplings. So even if you treat the, uh, the uh, if, if you don't think about the, um, the fixed point values for the gravitational couplings, um, you, you see that the fixed point values for the for the matter couplings um, can't become too large. So if you go to large values of the matter couplings, you're no longer getting a UV completion. So that's the, the first hint. Um, that, let's now move on to the second hint and that looks more closely at universal quantities, namely critical exponents. Um, and this was done um, quite extensively by Kevin Falls and Daniel Littemann collaborators um, for pure gravity. They looked for instance at the scaling exponents um, of <coughs> excuse me, of r to the n, going all the way to r to the 70. And what they plot here um, is this um, uh, script theta that is just um, the negative critical exponent. So you have an additional sign in order to translate to the standard um, convention for the critical exponents. Um, and you can compare the critical exponents at the asymptotically safe fixed point to the canonical scaling dimension. And the canonical scaling dimensions of the R to the N couplings are minus two plus four. And this is basically what gives you the, this, this line in this so-called near Gaussian strip. So you see that there is a departure from this near Gaussian scaling for the three leading critical exponents, which is something that we already saw for the Newton coupling. So for the Newton coupling, you need to change the canonical, you need to change from a negative canonical dimension to a positive scaling exponent. So there's a significant shift away from the um, canonical scaling, but then the higher you go um, in couplings, the more canonical it becomes. Um, you see something similar in um, gravity matter theories. And so um, this is work with one of my former PhD students where we looked at um, basically um, Yukawa um, sectors. So with um, scalar um, interactions um, and Yukawa couplings, um, and um, we looked at the critical exponents um, and the, the deviation um, from the, the canonical scaling, so from the critical exponents at the Gaussian fixed point, and we just calculated the root mean square um, of, these, um, uh, of this deviation, uh, and this is this quantity delta. And what you see in this plot here is the, the log of delta, so the more negative it becomes, the closer you are to canonical scaling. Um, and we look at that um, in this plane spanned by the gravitational coupling, um, that here is denoted little g and the um, cosmological constant little lambda. Um, and you can see 
um, that um, the deviation from canonical scaling is generically larger whenever you increase the Newton coupling because that cranks up the strength of the gravitational interaction. The behavior with the cosmological constant is um, maybe less um, intuitively obvious. Um, that comes because the gravitational contributions come with a Newton coupling divided by one minus, minus two lambda. Um, so the cosmological constant effectively acts like a mass parameter for gravity fluctuations. Um, and within the FRG, um, you always have the structure that masses appear in the denominator. And so because the gravity contributions come with this combination, G over one minus two lambda, one way to make the gravity contribution large is by making the Newton coupling large. The other is by um, going uh, with lambda um, towards um, one half. And so conversely, if you go with lambda to um, larger negative values, that's also a way um, to weaken the gravitational contribution. Um, and this left plot here shows you um, what happens um, with the gravitational contribution to the scaling exponents um, at the fixed point where the, where the matter couplings vanish. And this is at the fixed point where the matter couplings are finite. And you see the, the same qualitative behavior. And now we can actually overlay um, the, the fixed point results that I showed you previously. So um, one generation um, of um, standard model fermions brings you sort of close to a more non-perturbative regime. But then we move deeper into a near perturbative regime where this deviation becomes rather small um, as we um, get to, to three generations. So that's the, the second hint that this combined gravity meta theory with um, the standard model degrees of freedom is near perturbative in the sense that the scaling exponents um, do not assume um, large non-perturbative deviations from canonical scale. Um, that hint um, has another aspect to it, which is called the weak gravity bound um, in gravity matter systems. And that has to do with um, looking at higher order um, and non-minimal interactions. Um, so higher order interactions um, are in generically induced um, by gravity um, and canonically those interactions are irrelevant. And now if asymptotic safety was truly non-perturbative, then the gravitational contribution could potentially make um, these canonically irrelevant couplings relevant. And then you would suddenly have new relevant interactions in the matter sector tied to new free parameters. Um, and this danger exists for scalar fermion interactions, for gauge field interactions, and for scalar interactions. Um, and generically, those beta functions have a canonical dimension um, that um, uh, is then counteracted by a gravitational contribution. Um, and you can um, see the, the, the following. What happens here is that if this coupling um, is shifted towards um, relevance and becomes a, a free parameter, then you have to go through a point um, where, the, where in between um, the critical exponent um, vanishes. And in these simple approximations for the beta functions, that is actually a point um, where the beta function has a double zero, so where you have a fixed point collision. Um, and what happens beyond in these simple approximations is that you even lose the fixed point. Um, and now you can ask, well, how large does the gravitational contribution have to be um, in order for that to happen? And that gives you another definition of a more strongly coupled um, gravity regime. Um, and so, um, these corresponding weak gravity bounds um, lie um, at roughly similar locations um, for, for the different interactions. They don't lie at exactly the same location because um, this numerical coefficient here that differs for the different sectors. But so that's another way to see that this regime at lower value of the Newton coupling and more negative cosmological constant, that is a near perturbative regime in the sense that canonically irrelevant interactions stay irrelevant in that regime. Um, and now we can again um, ask, where does the actual fixed point lie? Um, and I'm going back to this plot that I showed you previously. And now I'm highlighting this red region that I did not talk about before. This is this, this region here that corresponds to the, the weak um, gravity bound um, where canonically irrelevant interactions would become relevant. And you see that the actual fixed point lies um, quite safely away from that regime. So another indication for this near perturbative nature of asymptotically safe gravity with matter. Now, um, the final hint um, has to do with non-trivial symmetry identities. Um, so for that, 
let me write um, an effective action with the um, Einstein-Hilbert term and then just kinetic terms for various meta fields, so scalars, um, fermions, um, and gauge interactions. And I can um, define various vertices here, so three graviton, four graviton vertex, and then graviton scalar vertices with one graviton and two gravitons, and then graviton fermion and graviton gauge field um, vertices. Um, and they all come with either the square root of the Newton coupling or um, are linear in the Newton coupling. So these vertices are sort of what we call avatars of the Newton coupling. And classically, all of these avatars are equal. Now, what happens um, when you gauge fix um, in a quantum theory, as you have to do for these FRG calculations, um, is that the gauge fixing actually um, breaks um, the, the, the symmetry. Um, and these avatars of the new coupling are generically no longer equal. Um, so an analogous thing happens in, in QCD, where things like the three gluon and the four gluon vertex or the quark gluon vertex are no longer equal um, if you go to the truly non-perturbative regime. So in, in a regime where quantum fluctuations are really important, you're no longer perturbative. So quantum fluctuations dominate over the classical contribution. In such a regime, you expect that these avatars are quite different from each other. Whereas if you're in a perturbative regime where basically the classical contribution is dominating, um, then you expect that these avatars are somewhat, um, are basically equal to each other. Um, and so um, we looked at that um, here and the takeaway message um, from the plot is that there is what we called effective universality, um, which means that at the gravitational fixed point, which is this red point here, um, the beta functions of these avatars are actually related to each other. Um, which is only something that you would expect in a near perturbative regime. You wouldn't expect that in a fully non-perturbative regime. And let me just explain the plot in a little bit more detail. Um, the two axes here are avatars of the cosmological constant, because you can also ex expand the cosmological constant term into the two point and the three point and higher order point functions. And then in this plane, um, you can compare um, beta functions um, of um, different different fields to each other, for instance, the uh, gravity um, and the, the meta beta function. Um, and then if you demand that all of these avatars are actually um, equal to each other, um, that actually holds within this green region um, here and um, that we, we've zoomed in in this left half of the plot. And then the gravitational fixed point falls right into the corner um, of this region. So that's a, a third um, hint um, for the near perturbative nature of asymptotic safety. Now, let me move on to why um, I actually care about that. So what are the consequences of this near perturbative nature? Why is it important that asymptotic safety isn't um, completely non-perturbative for gravity and matter? The first is that it means that we can actually develop um, an approach um, to relatively straightforwardly investigate the phenomenology of asymptotic safety, which, which is important for observational tests. Second, it means that approximation schemes that we use um, are actually self-consistent. And third, it could also have implications for the question of Euclidean versus Lorentzian signature. So let me um, briefly go into all of these um, three consequences. Um, the first consequence is that in a near perturbative regime, you can relatively straightforwardly in investigate the phenomenology of asymptotic safety beyond the standard model, um, because there you know what the qualitative form of the gravity contributions to meta couplings are. Um, you know that the effects are linear in the standard model couplings, only present beyond the Planck scale, um, and the same for all gauge groups and all flavors. And so this means that we can just parameterize the gravitational contribution um, to the beta functions in terms of such parameters, um, Fg and Fy, for instance, for the, the gauge um, quark sector. And then we can investigate what are the phenomenological consequences in this parameter space. Um, and I'll not go into the, the details of, of these plots here. Um, you're welcome to ask me if you're interested. Um, let me just highlight that, that this type of approach can then be used to investigate both the, the standard model um, in more detail, but also go beyond the standard model and ask questions that are motivated from a particle phenomenology point of view and investigate whether in principle asymptotic safety um, could UV complete um, settings beyond the standard model um, which are motivated, for instance, because they provide a dark matter model. 
Now, what is the second consequence of being near perturbative? It means that approximation schemes that are commonly used within um, functional renormalization group studies of asymptotic safety are self-consistent. So what we can namely do is we assume that the system is near perturbative, and that means that canonically higher order interactions would generically remain irrelevant. And so we can, in a first step, neglect them and just take into account the canonically relevant and marginal interactions. Then we can calculate the beta functions, find fixed points, and then, of course, check whether this whole thing is self-consistent and whether, indeed, um, the system is near perturbative. Um, and that actually means that for not near perturbative asymptotic safety, the truncations that are typically done in the literature, most results in the literature follow such a, a sort of canonical power, power counting, those are robust in this near perturbative setting. And they would not necessarily be robust if asymptotic safety was really full on non perturbative. And now the last consequence is a speculation um, about um, Euclidean versus Lorentzian signature. So FRG calculations um, are done in Euclidean signature, but of course what we care about in order to really describe quantum gravity in our universe is Lorentzian signature. Now, at the truly non-perturbative level of the path integral, it's completely unclear whether an analytic continuation exists, or you would actually typically expect that it doesn't exist because there are um, many space times um, for which an analytical continuation um, cannot be done um, on that space time or on that metric. However, if we are at a perturbative or near perturbative level, it actually means um, that um, it's a good approximation to the path integral to have um, a flat background and then have small fluctuations in the metric about that background. And then the problem of the analytic continuation is much more similar to standard quantum free theory on a flat background, where of course the analytical continuation of a theory is also not trivial, but much, uh, much more uh, within reach than in this non-perturbative level. Um, and so uh, the speculation that I'm advancing here is that if we have asymptotic safety in this near perturbative regime, then the results um, that were so far achieved that are basically virtually all um, in the Euclidean regime, that they might actually carry over to, to Lorentzian signature. And you can do an analytic continuation by really just looking at something like the graviton propagator in the complex uh, momentum uh, plane uh, about a flat background and look for whether it has poles or branch cuts that would prevent an analytic continuation. And there is work um, along those lines more recently. And so that um, uh, nearly brings me to my um, summary. I would just like to address one, one final question for those of you um, that, that would really like quantum gravity to be more non-perturbative. Um, and so that question would be, is this near perturbative setting really the final answer? Um, and um, it doesn't have to be. Um, because the, the appealing thing about asymptotic safety is that the predictions that it generates, for instance, for the standard model, they also apply in a setting that we call effective asymptotic safety, which is a setting where you have some UV scale. Um, here I call that the, the string scale, but it could also be some other non-perturbative theory beyond um, where, um, where once you leave um, that... Um, that other theory and you go into um, an effective quantum field theory for gravity and matter, an asymptotically safe fixed point would still attract you along its irrelevant directions and in this way generate predictions for the standard model couplings that I talked about before. Um, and so one way, of course, to go um, beyond such a near perturbative asymptotic safety wouldn't necessarily be string theory, um, but actually um, tensor models um, where, where gravity has some form of sort of pre-geometric phase in the very far UV. Um, and of course, we can also use functional renormalization group techniques to investigate that. And I would just like to highlight uh, very briefly um, results um, from 2019, where we looked at a particular rank four tensor model um, that could potentially model um, four dimensional space time. And we found interacting an interacting fixed point where the critical exponents, if you look at the spectrum, actually have similarity to what one sees in the continuum asymptotic safety studies because there are two relevant directions. We're missing a third one that one typically sees in continuum asymptotic safety studies, but these two relevant directions actually have a very similar sized critical exponent to what one typically sees in the continuum studies, and then all of the higher order interactions are irrelevant. And so um, this um, gives rise to, to the speculation that potentially um, there is a really non-perturbative 
um, strongly coupled non-geometric phase in gravity in the very deep UV, but you then transition to something like asymptotic safety in this paradigm of effective asymptotic safety um, for a, a range of scales, and that um, generates predictions for the standard model couplings and beyond standard model couplings, and um, those then can be used to check the scenario in the deep infrared. And so with this final speculation, um, I'm um, coming to my summary. Um, so the, the view I'm advocating about quantum gravity here is that non-perturbative quantum gravity is main, maybe only necessary in the very deep UV, um, and that we can um, get away to uh, in describing um, physics at the Planck scale and even beyond uh, with a near perturbative setting. That fits very nicely to the fact that the standard model itself is actually perturbative at the Planck scale. And so it makes sense that its UV completion doesn't first bring the model into a widely non-perturbative regime and then induces a UV completion, but that the UV completion matches on um, to this, this perturbative nature. It also means that we can relatively straightforwardly develop a phenomenology of that model and um, investigate beyond standard model settings um, in, in, in that paradigm. Um, and um, we get um, predictions for a subset of the standard model couplings, and we can avoid free parameters that would be linked to higher order interactions, which would which could become relevant in a truly non-perturbative regime. And I highlighted the, the evidence um, for that, um, for that um, scenario, which is the perturbative size of the matter and gravity contributions at the Planck scale, the near canonical critical exponents, and finally, the fact that these non-trivial symmetry identities hold. And so with that, um, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you, Esther. Thanks very much.